I'm DJ Psyched, and you're watching the Get Psyched YouTube channel. Let's get psyched about YouTube. This is the Get Psyched podcast. I'm DJ Psyched, and today I'm super psyched because I'm joined with Dr. Nikos to talk about his new book, To Live Woke. Dr. Nikos is a social psychologist that teaches at NC State University and teaches two of the best courses I've ever taken. And your teaching has taught me so much about how to interact in your everyday life and social situations. And so I'm really excited to talk about your new book today because I think it could help a lot of people do just that. So thank you for talking to me today. And for anyone who hasn't read the book just yet, can you please give me some background of yours and tell us a bit about yourself? I'm Professor Rupert Nakos, uh, alumni distinguished undergraduate professor. I've been at North Carolina State University as a professor going on 31 years. I'm originally from the Louisiana Bayou. My work is on social interaction, as Leanne has just said, and especially this new time we live in, this time I describe as neo-diverse. That is, we live in a time where we all have to in interact with people not like us on some dimension. Uh, race, yes, but it's sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, and so on. And I've been working on this for some time. I uh, created a new course, Independence and Race, back in 2006, using the new concept of neo-diversity, which I just described and have also written two books, Taking On Diversity, How We Can Move From Anxiety to Respect, and my newest, To Live Woke, Thoughts to Carry in Our Struggle to Save the Soul of America. Neodiversity is a concept that you created. Uh, how did you come to conclude that we're living in a neodiverse time? The interesting advantage I have in combining my life experiences and my social psychological eye is that I can look at social life in stages. So I grew up in the Jim Crow South. But I know that we move from legal racial segregation to desegregation to attempts to talk about diversity when we started talking about women's issues. And then there was this explosion of a mix of groups. And I was just keeping my eye on that. And I was seeing how it was affecting students on our campus. And I knew there had to be a different way to describe this so people would understand something new was going on. And so that's where I came up with the idea of neo-diversity. Yeah. Before we jump into like specific topics that you talk about that surround neodiversity, I think it's important to make a point that you make in the book that racism, bigotry, and prejudice are all very different. Could you elaborate on that for anyone who doesn't know the differences? Differences between prejudice, bigotry, and racism. Prejudice is not bigotry, is not racism as I write and talk about all the time. Prejudice is feelings, anti-group feelings. Does a person who hold a prejudice have a prejudice, have to show that in their behavior. Well, no, but if they do, that's bigotry. Racism, as we have finally started to talk in the right way in America, racism is a system. Racism is institutional and organizational systems that support individual prejudice and bigotry. So we look at the case in Minneapolis of the policeman with his knee on a black man's neck, and he seems unconcerned about being videoed. Why? He believes the system will protect him. That's systematic racism, or racism, really. That's a great point to bring up. So now getting back to neodiversity, because I think neodiversity is just such an important concept because like you talk about in your class and your book, neodiversity is causing an anxiety in a situation in America today. Can you explain why it's important to understand neodiversity and, and what these anxieties are doing to people? Sure. The thing about neodiversity is, again, it's new, and it means that take students coming to a university like NC State, wherever you've come from, you've never quite seen this amount of diversity. You've never seen this mix of people. That's neodiversity. But students report this to me all the time. They come to our campus, it freaks them out they feel like, oh my God, there's so many different people here. How am I supposed to interact? How am I supposed to know how to interact? That's an, those are anxiety questions. And that means people are kind of tiptoeing. And as soon as you're tiptoeing in social interaction, you're about to mess up. Yeah. And so another concept of yours, I think is important to tie into that, that anxiety and messing up is you always talk about how no one is innocent and we all make these mistakes. There yeah. are no innocent. And what I mean is, nope, there's no one in in the world, but let's talk about America. No one in America who doesn't have some kind of stereotype about some group. We develop stereotypes without knowing we're developing stereotypes. 
And America is a country that rests on segregation, and segregation breeds stereotypes. And what that means is people are walking around with ideas in their heads, some of them that they're not quite aware of, that are going to get in the way of having an authentic social interaction with someone. There are no innocent. So who can mess up? Well, everybody can mess up. Black people can mess up, white people can mess up, gays and lesbians can mess up. Eh. Everybody can make a mistake because the stereotype drives you to do something that I warn people not to do. Never try to interact with a person as a representative of a group. As soon as you do that, you're causing interaction trouble. That is the, the most powerful way to start this kind of conversation when you talk about your nine tips in interacting in uh, the neodiverse world and with people who are unlike us is that you should never interact as a representative of the group. And yeah, there's, there's nine tips that you share in the book and they're all just worth listening to. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I wrote this book for a number of reasons, but one of the things I wanted it to be was a guide. It's one thing to talk about the problem of American racism and say, look at it, here it is. And a lot of books do that. But people, especially young people, need something that tells them, okay, I know it's gonna cause me anxiety, what should I do? And so that's a really an important part of what I was trying to get at and trying to do for the reader. Give them a guide about how to deal with this situation you cannot avoid. Yeah, and I think this book does a, a brilliant job at doing that, explaining what we can do to be productive and to actually have a conversation and to do things in our interpersonal lives that will matter. And I think there's a lot of points and a few that I wanted to touch on real quick that I think are just really thought provoking as far as having a productive conversation. And so one of the first things I want to bring up was your uh, views on the term and using the term white privilege when trying to have a conversation with someone. When you talk about white privilege, you like to talk about how ah. it's not productive and can be very guilt provoking and, and why it is you don't like that term. Even though we know people have privileges, it's not productive to present something like that in that way. Well, the problem is the privilege that people are talking about is a legacy of racism. So it's a legacy of a system. You, took, you take that idea and you aim it at one individual and the individual is like, well, I didn't set this up. I didn't mean for this to be happening, so what am I supposed to do? That's why I say it's not a productive. I'm not saying there are not legacies of racism. I'm saying for the individual, for helping people know what to do, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. In my class, I say, I ask this question when people want to talk about white privilege. I say, where were you in 1967? Well, nobody in my class can answer that question except to say I wasn't born. Exactly. So did you do something to me as a black man? Uh, no, you didn't. Does that mean the system wasn't working? No, I'm not saying it wasn't working. The system has always been down, but we don't need to, we don't need to tear individuals down to do that. The issue with the concept is that it's, it's trying to talk about a system that is racism, but it's aiming it at an individual. So yes, there, there's a system. But was that individual, the individual you're talking to right now, are they responsible for it? But that's a system problem, not an individual problem. And not attack individuals. We want to bring everybody into the conversation. Yeah, and I think uh, you talk about this a lot too in your book, that like language is very important and the kind of language and terms we use. And another term that I was thinking of was unconscious bias and how you say that that is also something we should throw out of our vocabulary. Well, <laughs> people love to do this Freudian stuff, unconscious. Okay, just to be frank, unconscious my ass. Look, <laughs> people know what they feel. So it's not unconscious. People love doing this Freudian stuff that doesn't add up to anything. But it, unconscious, oh my God. Okay, so it's not unconscious. People know what they feel. They know they feel nervous when the big black man walks in the room. When I walk in the room, I know they feel it because I see it in their eyes. I see it in their nonverbal behavior. So it's not unconscious. People don't want to admit it. That's a different problem. That's a different problem. We have to work on having people admit to themselves, not to me, to themselves what's going on. And that way they can start to deal with it. You tell people it's unconscious, that means they don't have to deal with it. 
Yeah. And that was, that was one of your tips is that you should acknowledge whenever you're seeing a stereotype and set it aside before you start interacting with someone. Right. And even if it happens during the interaction, just catch yourself. Realize you, you know, you want to talk to people in these what turn out to be funny ways. Yes, I am tall. I am black. I got broad shoulders and all of that. Don't start talking to me about sports. I never play sports. I don't care about sports. But in your head, that's how you talk to a big black man. Stop yourself. And it limits your interactions. It limits your ability to develop relationships. And another important conversation around language that I think is one of the, it's is just a point that really needs to be made because a lot of people have a way these days of when they're using group slurs, they tend to say things like, well, it's just a joke or that's I'm good. a member of this group, so it's fine. But why, why is it so important for people to realize that no group slur is innocent? Right. No group slur is innocent. That's the perfect way to say it. Because group slurs are attached to a history. So, the N-word. People say, I can use it because I'm, I'm friends with a black person who says I can use it. Well, the black person doesn't own the word either. The word is historical. And it's attached to what? Lynchings, castration, church burnings, bombings. You can't get rid of that history. If you look at any anti-group slur, it has a history attached to it that is violent. And every time you use it, that history is sitting right there. So it's not innocent. It's not something to play with. Uh, I have a chapter in the book called Hesitation in Charleston. It's about Dylan Roof and his moment of hesitation. He said, he sat with these black people in the Emmanuel Church. They welcomed him warmly. He knew what he was there for. But they welcomed him so warmly that he had a moment of hesitation. In that moment of hesitation, he heard no voices telling him that he shouldn't do it. He had no voices in, from his past that said, ooh, those ideas you have are not really good ideas. How do we know that? His friends were interviewed after. And his so-called friends said, oh, yeah, he used to say those things, but we thought he was just joking. We didn't take it seriously. There are no innocent anti-group jokes, anti-group language, anti-group hate. And what, what would you say, because I hear this a lot when people try to justify why they use these words. They say they're trying to reclaim the word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. That means you have to erase the history back to that point. You can't get rid of the fact that the N-word is attached to lynchings, castrations, church burnings, bombings, you can't get rid of that. So what are you taking back? What are you going back to? You're going back to, wow, wow. That's a silly argument. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think the last, last thing people always like to say whenever people point out that they shouldn't say it or do certain things is that, well, there's just so much political correctness, I don't even know what to do anymore. The idea of political correctness has arisen because of this. We live in a new world, a neo-diverse America. And in that neo-diverse America, groups of people who had been pushed to silence are no longer silent. They are saying, no, I will not be talked about that way and I will not be talked to that way. They want respect that they deserve. And so now people are trying to push back saying, well, you're just you're trying to make me be politically correct. Nope trying to make you be respectful of other people in this democracy. And that kind of goes on to the next point I wanted to make about uh, superordinate goals and how groups have to work together to overcome this. Um, can you tell us a little more about that? One of the things that social psychologists discovered uh, almost a hundred years ago is the idea of a superordinate goal, which is a goal that had, can only be met when two previously antagonistic groups work together. We actually had that in the, in the 60s, where whites joined the civil rights movement. So people always need to understand this. The civil rights movement was not just black people pushing forward. It was a set of coalitions, superordinate goal. Turns out we are living in a moment with this new Black Lives Movement that literally, literally is a superordinate goal. Who is in the protest? Is this a black protest? No, look who's out there. Just look. And then there are identities you can't see, but 
but you see the signs of from gays and lesbians. You see the signs from trans people. This is a moment where groups that did not in the past collaborate or not collaborate enough are now all together working on this one goal the, the, to erase racism, to make it clear that black lives matter. That's the superordinate goal of today. And that is so powerful and important. Yes, it definitely is. I, I totally agree. Like a superordinate goal is very important. And that's why I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on this cancel culture that we live yeah. in that tends to attack people for mistakes that they made a long time ago or things that they might not necessarily even believe anymore, but they, they do get attacked for having it in the past. So one of the things I talk about, one of the reasons I wrote the book and called it To Live Woke is one of my students wrote a paper about social justice warriors. She said, today it's very in to be a social justice warrior, to be woke. But what I noticed, she said, is that a lot of people who are so-called woke spend their time denigrating other people because of things they've done in the past or they're not doing it the right way. That's not being woke. To be woke is to create, to work to create collaborations. My father was a civil rights activist, a voting rights activist specifically. And my father worked with previous people who had been previously Klansmen. He did not cancel them. They said they wanted to, to change. They wanted to do something different. You brought them into the conversation. That's how you live woke. We need to bring people into the conversation. Cancel culture is actually another form of bigotry. Because what it is, is it's anti-group feelings about people who've made mistakes in the past. You classify them as a group and you cancel that's a form of bigotry. I had never thought of it that way. And so uh, one more thing I really want to talk about was this sales pitch in America and the way that people are taught. Can you elaborate on what the sales pitch is for anyone who doesn't know? Right. So I did this TED talk where I talked about the, the, the sales pitch and I started off by singing America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of green. That's the sales pitch. It's all beautiful and warm and cuddly. And the same time slavery was going on. Okay. <laughs> so it's a sales pitch. It's a way of making you not think about the reality of America. And that's why you get some dynamics that we're seeing rising up again. That is attached to what I call hibernating bigotry. It's been there. But now it's rising up again because people are saying, look, we've got problems. And some people who don't want to hear that, who want to think about only America the beautiful, or doing this old thing, love it or leave it. You don't like it, get out of here. Okay, no, that's not America. That is not America. But people who have bought the sales pitch, who want to hang on to this shiny image, the shiny, warm, cuddly image of America, who are really troubled by the truth. Here's something that just happened today. Hugh McCray, one of the people who was involved in, the, one of the white people who was involved in the Wilmington coup, there's a Hugh McCray Park. They just changed the name. That is going to piss some people off. But you know what? It should be changed because otherwise it honored a man who promoted white supremacy to the level of killing black people in the streets. But if you don't want to hear that, if you don't, if America the Beautiful, you want, yes, this, we're fine. It's really, it can be really troubling for you. But the sales pitch is dangerous. If you buy it, trust me, you bought a car that will not run. And I remember one time we talked about it in class, and I think someone had mentioned that they thought that the sales pitch was winning. And you mentioned that you think that that's not true. And I think that you were totally right about that because NC State just did the same thing by renaming that one hall on campus or by shutting its name down. Right. More to come. Yeah. More to come. Because now we are faced with the reality of what has, what has happened in the past, the history which is why, again, anti-group language is historical. It's not in the moment. And so names matter. Who you honor matters to a neo-diverse population. If it was only one set of people here, you could get away with it. It's what people do about the South. People say, well, I'm a Southerner. This is what I believe. Okay, you know, the South has always been racially mixed. 
So people who usually say that act as if there are no black people in the South. Uh, right here, my father born in 1918 in deep South Louisiana. We were here. We've always been here. I'm a Southerner. So the idea of Southern heritage being only white is itself a bigotry. And, and like you said at the beginning, the reason you wrote this book is because you want to give people this information and you want them to be able to go out and, and use it and apply it. So what would you say people should do now? What, what should they do now? Yeah, I'm getting that question a lot. What should I do now? Not everybody should, what I've been saying is not everybody should be doing the same things. So I'm a professor. Should I be marching? Two things. I'm an old professor, so mm, no, I'm not marching. So, <laughs> but I'm doing my scholarly stuff, my getting messages out. I'm on a lot of calls right now, uh, giving people new ideas, helping people think through their ideas. So not everybody should be doing the same thing. How do you be an ally? One of the basic ways to be an ally is to first self-examine. Well, start working on yourself. Start looking at who you are and the way you've done things in the past and the way you've thought about things in the past and clean that, begin to clean that up. Then what do you do? Well, if you are somebody who wants to do marches, do marches. If you're somebody who wants to do art, do art. If you're somebody who wants to do podcasts, do podcasts. Everybody can make a contribution somehow. We shouldn't all be doing the same thing, but everybody should be doing something. Definitely. And even, as you say, like, uh, on a much smaller scale, interpersonally, we can, we can learn to react in a moment when we see something that's not correct. Um, and when we hear someone use language that we know they shouldn't be using. So for anyone who's trying to find out how to do that, what is your advice for them? So there's a set of experiments that were done and published in a peer-reviewed journal in psychology. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. They, they took on this question. How do you manage a moment of interpersonal bigotry that you're involved in? You're talking to somebody and they say something about somebody being a retard. Holy moly. And that'll freeze the interaction, you, as we all know. Sometimes. Sometimes people just laugh it off or they say they're just joking. They make excuses. Nope, don't do that. Because that lets the hostility towards people with mental health conditions build. So what do you do? The strategy is this. As soon as the person says it and you gather yourself, don't yell, don't argue, don't tell them they shouldn't talk that way. Just say this, oh, I am very uncomfortable with that kind of anti-group language. I find it offensive, it hurts me, and then stop talking. Just say that. What you've done is you've let the person know that if they want to continue to interact with you, that's not the kind of language you're willing to listen to. What that does is very interesting, the research shows, that it makes the person who used the term feel very, very bad about themselves. And that changes the moment. And that's a strategy. Now, if the person wants to argue with you, make your statement again. If they want to keep arguing, walk away. Or as I say in class, walk the hell away. I love hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you talking to me uh, about your book. And this is only scratching the surface of what is in this book. There's a lot more that is covered. But is there anything else you would like to say to anyone listening? Well, two things. One is read Leanne's blog about the book. It's a good description of what the book is about. It gives a, a broader picture. The other thing is about this moment in, in American history, because this is a real significant moment in American history, and the question of what you should be doing. Every time somebody asks me that question, I think of the poem by Anna Bontemps, The Daybreakers. Anna Bontemps wrote a poem, uh, he's a Harlem Renaissance poet, and he wrote it, and he, he said this, we all not come to wage a strife with swords upon this hill. It is not wise to waste a life against a stubborn will. Yet would we die, as some have done, beating away for the rising sun. Beating away for the rising sun. We all can work on this. We all have a contribution to make. We all can do our part to beat away for the rising sun. Thank you again for being on, Dr. Nikos. And To Live Woke is a must read. I'm going to link the book in the description. If I mean, you should pick up a copy of it, so check down below. And uh, 
until next time, let's just stay psyched. Thank you, Leanne.